Hi everyone, my name is George Veth. It's great to have you all with us. Welcome to the inaugural episode of Public Value Conversations. In this series of video podcasts, we will talk about the idea of public value, as well as expound on the frameworks behind what we call public value thinking. Today and throughout this series, I have the distinct pleasure of working with my colleague and friend, Professor Mark Moore. He's the person who originated the idea of public value and who has spurred on the field of academic thought and research behind its practice. Mark has written two seminal books on the topic, the first, Creating Public Value, and the second, Recognizing Public Value. In this episode, I will ask Mark to take the time to elaborate on the general idea of public value. In future episodes, it'll be more of a back and forth discussion. We're also aided by my colleague and illustrator, Abigail Ekstrom, who will leverage her visual scribing to capture our thoughts while we chat. As you will see, her creative work begins around minute three of the discussion. We're always open to your thoughts, and you can reach me at george.veth at adaptablelabs.com if you'd like to continue the conversation. Thanks, and enjoy. Mark, let's jump right into public value and talk a little bit about what it is. Mark, I know that you've been working in the space of public value for quite a while. Could you give us a little bit of your background um, in terms of thinking about and researching public value? Sure. I was an undergraduate at uh, Yale, and I took a special program there called Political Science and Economics. Um, and so it was a highly interdisciplinary applied program. Um, and that prepared me both in economics and in political science and in philosophy. Uh, and I took those areas because I thought they would be important to a person who wanted to be uh, in the game of um, uh, creating public value or making public policy. Excellent. So how did that lead to this idea of public value and the term public value? Well, I would. so it goes along with the fact that when I graduated from Yale, they had created uh, a new program at Harvard University. It was called the Public Policy Program, and it was sitting in the Kennedy School of Government. And what they were offering at that time uh, was to a master in public policy and a PhD in public policy. And what they, as I say, offered was the chance to learn some analytic techniques that could improve um, the rationality, the logic, the evidence uh, behind important public policy decisions. And that seemed like a really good idea to me and one where my training in politics, philosophy, and economics uh, would be ideal. So I signed up eagerly and was in the very first class of that program. Great. And so now from there, over the decades, you've developed a, a concept of public value. Tell us, what is public value? So the idea of public value came to me as I was walking down the hall um, fairly early in my career at the Kennedy School. And we were trying to teach students about how to imagine what would be a valuable change in the world. Um, and we were also trying to think about how to produce that through government. Um, and we kept coming up against this question about, well, what words should we use to describe what it is that government did? And I suddenly thought, well, the private sector produces private value. Maybe the government produces public value. And that was the beginning of it. And I thought to myself, uh, now all I have to do is figure out what I mean by public value uh, and who gets to define it uh, and how do we measure it and how do we produce it. And so if I ask you what is public value, what would you say is a short elevator pitch on what is public value? Okay, so the short answer to it is that two words that are uh, sort of um, a question masquerading as a statement uh, or an answer. Uh, and so the idea that you needed to have some way to describe what the valuable uh, results of governmental activity would be. We were living at that time uh, uh, at a time when people were calling the government the unproductive sector, right? And I thought that was completely implausible because I thought the government was producing all kinds of things that were valuable, uh, incredibly valuable to large numbers of people. And to have it be called the unproductive sector seemed to me to be a terrible mistake. Um, and um, so the question then was, how could we begin uh, naming, observing, counting, 
uh, the various effects that government had that could be assigned a value that would compensate those of us who had to give up some of our money to taxation and those of us who had to give up some of our liberty to uh, regulatory authority of government. Um, and so it was an effort to raise in people's minds the idea uh, that government could be value creating and it could be value creating in this particular set of dimensions that could be called public value. Um, and that meant that <clears throat> um, we had to have an idea about who could be the arbiter of the value that was being produced. And in the commercial sector, it was individuals. But in the public sector, when we were using the collectively owned assets of government, it had to be some political and governmental process that decided what was valuable to produce and then named it and began measuring it and observing it and determining whether we had in fact succeeded in creating net public value that meant uh, the citizens got more out of our efforts than they had to pay in the form of taxation or restricted liberty. It took me a while to uh, figure out exactly how to I wanted to organize it and then to understand uh, the significance of what it was that I'd done, right? So uh, having been trained at least in part in economics, uh, I began with the economist view of value. And one of the important ideas in microeconomics is that individuals are the proper arbiters of value, all right? Uh, and uh, we have objective evidence of how individuals value things because they plunk their money down uh, and take away a good or service as a consequence of that purchase. And so if the question is, is did that individual value that? The answer is, well, yes. How do we know that? Well, they took money out of their pocket and paid for it, all right? Um, and so we begin with uh, sort of an idea that individual valuations of material conditions and goods and services, all right? Particularly goods and services rather than conditions um, is one dimension of public value. So you check that off and you say, Individuals like material goods and services. They also like conditions like being safe and secure for which they pay for insurance, right? And a variety of other things that individuals might be interested in, uh, not just goods and services, but being able to buy peace of mind, for example, or to um, live near a park or a variety of other things like that. So it's not narrowly consumption, but it's something that individuals value for themselves and their own material well-being. Then staying with the idea that the important arbiter of value should be an individual. This was a sort of a basic democratic idea. You, nobody could tell you what to value. You had to value it for yourself. Um, I also, of course, knew from my philosophical training and from my political training that people were interested in the question of justice and fairness, as well as whether they could consume uh, uh, goods uh, and enjoy material advantages. And they were interested in justice and fairness for themselves. So there were these in strongly felt individual ideas about wants, needs, and rights that were present in human beings from the very beginning, right? Um, and the wants could be handled sort of in the economist frame, but the needs and rights uh, might have to be handled in a frame that was more about, uh, so they had an idea that they needed it, and they had an idea that they had a right to it, <clears throat> but somebody else had to agree to that uh, with them. And it became then uh, an idea of uh, right relationships or justice and fairness rather than simply want, right? But both of, so this of course corresponded then in philosophical terms to uh, the idea of utilitarianism, uh, which is the basic philosophical idea that says um, aggregate social conditions should be evaluated in terms of producing the greatest good for the greatest number, all right, where the good emphasizes material well-being. And it gets to net value by saying the more people that feel benefited by it uh, relative to the cost of producing it, the better the aggregate result is. And therefore, uh, we should do those things that satisfy them most people at the least cost to others. Um, we can come back to that in a, in a minute. The, um, but the other philosophical principle is a uh, philosophical system that's called deontology, and it's concerned with questions about what's right and proper and just and fair, right? And it refers more to a set of understandings about uh, relationships among people and what one person owes to the other 
as a matter of justice and fairness rather than simply as a matter of desire or need, all right? So you then, so you start with one little cell, if you will, in a two by two matrix, which is uh, individuals want things. And to the extent the state supplies them, uh, uh, that represents value creation in the same way that the market creates value, all right? Uh, and that also gives rise to the idea that, um, you know, citizens as customers of government, that we ought to be trying to, um, you know, provide benefits to particular individuals that they value in their terms, right? Then we go, and that's the utilitarian, individual utilitarian idea. Then we go to the uh, individual idea of justice and fairness. And there the person says, well, I have needs that the society, if it were a good society, all right, would supply me with, or I have uh, rights, uh, which if it were a good society, I would be vindicated for me, right? And I'm having the experience that neither of those things is true. So now, uh, and therefore an improvement in my condition in the dimension of deontological ideas is that I feel like I'm being more justly and fairly treated and that the needs that I might have from uh, society as a whole um, might uh, be given to me as a matter of uh, not only public welfare, but also as a matter of justice, right? So individual interest in the good, individual interests in the uh, just and the fair. But throughout this, notice that what keeps looming up everywhere is this idea that there's a collective out there as well as a individual. Uh, and that the collective is making judgments uh, about, uh, uh, about what's good for it, all its members, if you will, and also what's just and fair for all of its members. So now you've got a uh, two by two matrix in which you could think of there being effects that government produces that register at the individual level with respect to material satisfaction and gratification and uh, material well being. There's an experience that government can create that creates a sense of fairness and justice at the individual level where I'm, uh, my rights are being uh, vindicated uh, and my ideas about what I need are being adjudicated at the collective level to be um, uh, something that we would all agree to and provide sort of as a privilege, perhaps as a right as, uh, as well, right? And then there's this broad, and then suddenly you make this big leap and you say, well, well, there's this other thing though, that there's, uh, how do we add up those individual experiences, all right? Um, and how do we decide whether uh, the aggregate condition of the society we're living in is good or just and fair, right? And that brings you then this second tier of consideration, which is I'm now a person looking around me and I know what my own experience is from the point of view of material welfare and what the uh, experience, my experience is with respect to justice and fairness. But I'm looking around and witnessing the conditions of large numbers of other people. And I'm comparing that to my own idea of what a good and just society might be, all right? And that would be perhaps if I have a broad enough imagination and degree of sympathy, it would be one that treated all individuals well materially, that met their needs, that uh, treated them fairly and justly. Um, and I now as an individual think not only about myself living in these conditions, but I can see the conditions in which other people are living. Um, and I can say, I think I'm living in a society that is reliably good, that it's providing material things that the population as a whole needs, or I'm living in a society where, uh, and a society that's just, where people are getting what they're entitled to and what they deserve, all right? Um, and on that basis, then I can choose to participate in a collective process of deliberation that decides whether we should use the collectively owned powers of the state, namely tax dollars and regulatory authority, to produce something different than what we're currently observing. And that gives us then these four uh, different elements of uh, public value.